to this subject consistently for those 40 years. I'd like to mention two theorems of uh, his that can be taught in an elementary differential geometry class, and I consider them uh, very beautiful theorems. The first is a theorem that uh, Bill proved with uh, David Hoffman. It's called the half-space theorem that says that if you take a immersed, complete minimal surface in three-dimensional space that is properly immersed, so its intersection with a compact ball is always compact. If you suppose it's in a half space, so say it's a the last coordinate z is greater than or equal to zero on the whole surface, then that surface is necessarily a plane. It's parallel to the xy plane in that situation. So that's called the half space theorem. The proof is really uh, a beautiful proof, and it turns out that the idea of behind the proof and the theorem is very useful to minimal surface theory. Okay, that's one of the theorems that uh, one can teach in a differential geometry class to students and really show them something great. The other theorem is uh, concerns uh, properly embedded constant mean curvature surfaces in R3 where the mean curvature is different from zero. So not minimal surfaces, they're like models perhaps on soap bubbles real soap bubbles. And the theorem says that if you consider a surface that has the topology of the plane, then you cannot properly embed that in Euclidean three space with constant mean curvature different from zero. You can do it for a cylinder. We know cylinders have constant mean curvature. But you cannot do it for a plane. That's, that's one of the theorems I really like that one can explain to students. OK, so that's enough presentation to build. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy to be here. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to just talk about um, not really giving any proofs. Um, uh, I'm working with one Brazilian here, um, Alvaro uh, Ramos, and he's going to give a talk about something I'm just going to mention in my talk. But basically, it's just, it's just sort of a, lots of pictures, uh, sort of an idea of what the theory is about, you know, so you can kind of place yourself. And some, some key definitions. Uh, there is a sketch of a proof at the end, if I get that far. Okay, so um, let me just start here. Standard picture, we have the Gauss map, we have the, uh, so it's derivative, which gives rise to the, to the shape operator, or second fundamental form. And from that uh, derivative, we get various invariants. We get principal curvatures at points. Uh, we get Gaussian curvature, the mean curvature. Notice I divide by two. Uh, to get the mean curvature. Uh, we have the norm of the second fundamental form. Uh, essentially, if K1 and K2 are small, then the surface locally looks like a pretty flat graph. And so this number being small means it locally looks like a plane, close to a plane, a small perturbation of the plane, if, those, if that function is uniformly small. Or, yeah, uniformly small. And then we have some relationships between those uh, functions. Okay. Uh, do I point? I point it, maybe I point it over here. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking about constant mean curvature surfaces. And uh, throughout my talk, uh, it's much easier to communicate by calling uh, constant mean curvature H surfaces, uh, H surfaces themselves. So if, I, if you see a green H hyphen something, then that's constant mean curvature, that green H, and that green H is usually a non-negative number. It could be, I mean, yeah, non-negative number. Okay. So uh, these surfaces appear uh, as um, critical points to sort of natural problems. Like you take a compact surface, um, compact piece of a surface, and you look for variations that fix the boundary and preserve volume. That means when you push on one side, you push just as much volume on the other side. And those are called volume preserving. Uh, or if it doesn't have boundary, you call these compactly supported variations. And you want the surfaces to be critical points, the area, with respect to those particular kinds of variations. In particular, if you solve an isoparametric problem in a manifold, fixed volume, minimize the perimeter or the surface area, then those surfaces automatically satisfy this property of being critical points because they minimize the, the, the uh, area subject to a volume constraint. Okay, and then we have, of course, the very special case uh, which is the case when the mean curvature is identically zero. 
Okay, so not not constant, but constant zero. And then we, in those cases, we don't have to restrict the variations that we pick. We just need compactly supported va variations. There is zero at the boundary. And then you get their critical points to area. And here are some two famous examples, the catenoid and the helicoid. And uh, since these problems are related to energy on surfaces and energies of mappings, it turns out soap films on wires have the property that they have zero mean curvature, or at least approximately. I mean, they're molecules and things are moving around. But, but, but uh, the surface tension creates a very tight energy minimizing surface, which forces the principal curvatures to have equal and opposite signs, the surface tension. And then we have soap bubbles. It's kind of like a film where you have different constant pressure differences on both sides of the soap film. Okay? So she's blowing, or whoever it is is blowing, and you got a different air pressure inside than you have outside. You can imagine warping that, not being a circle, then you'll still make a soap bubble. You're blowing, keeping pressure different inside, then you'll get a small perturbation of a sphere. It won't be exactly round. But in this picture, it's like, it looks like it's a round circle. Okay, so we have those kinds of things. Harold actually mentioned this result. Okay, so the question is, is the round sphere Okay, the only complete, simply connected surface embedded in R3 with non-zero constant mean curvature. So if you're compact, then that's, uh, that's a well-known result. In fact, you can say immersed, that's Hopf's theorem. An immersed sphere of constant mean curvature in R3 is round. So this is really a question about topology. Can I have a plane in R3 that's complete and embedded and um, Mm, yeah, uh, can I have a non-zero constant mean curvature? So we have cylinders, not simply connected, and we can even map the, comp the plane into R3 with um, conformally, but it's not embedded, okay? So we have these constant mean curvature planes, but they're not embedded. And so the answer to the question is yes, and so I'm going to try to indicate a little bit, um, at least some idea about why this might be the case. Okay, so. In particular, we have this theorem, okay? Spheres are the only complete, simply connected surfaces embedded in R3 with non-zero constant mean curvature. No, no planes. Now, if you go back a long time ago, I've been interested in this problem a long time ago, and it's actually got interested in this problem by a question that Harold asked me many years ago. But anyway, maybe it was before 1986. It was, that's when it was published. But a few years earlier, uh, I think maybe I was even, I don't think I was at EMPA at the time. But anyway, a long time ago. Uh, so I proved this under an, a different hypothesis, properly embedded. Essentially, properly embedded here means in a ball of radius r, I always have finite area. It's uh, pre-image of compact sets are compact in the intrinsic topology on the surface. Intrinsic Riemannian topology. Okay, so we had a, a special case of this, but this Complete and embedded is different than complete properly embedded. It's a different kind of question, and it's hard. It's, uh, when things are not proper, things are hard. Okay, so uh, in the case of minimal surfaces, uh, this, this problem was uh, completely understood um, by work of uh, those people. And in that case, we only have the plane and the helicoid. So minimal and simply connected, we completely understand what it happens. And now that theorem up there gives us the remaining case, which was positive mean curvature, non-zero constant mean curvature. Okay, so I'll just tell you some aspects of the proof here. Um, so, or actually, mention these uh, little diff slightly different results. So, if you have a minimal surface, complete in R three, connected, embedded H surface, uh, positive injectivity radius implies it's properly embedded. Okay. So that's a one result. We have finite topology always has positive injectivity radius. You have to prove that. It's easy for minimal. It's not so easy when it's not minimal. But anyway, uh, if it has uh, finite topology, uh, then it always has positive injectivity radius, and then it's always properly embedded. So a plane is, has that kind of property. A plane would then be properly embedded. And we could apply my old result. Uh, we have a sort of a general result that says, what are those constant mean curvature surfaces that are complete and embedded 
um, <coughs> they are pers they, and have bound a second fundamental form. So bound a second fundamental form is equivalent to having positive injectivity base. Positive injectivity base implies proper. So bound a second fundamental form, we know from some old work we have Harold and myself, complete embedded uh, bound a second fundamental form were always proper. So we knew that many, many years ago. Okay? So this kind of just ties up things a little bit better. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, some of this work is related to work by other people, like myself and Harold, and, um, and, and also work of Colin Minicosi, who did it in the minimal case. Uh, we also did some of this in the minimal case, Harold and I. Okay. Item three, right, item three even holds in the homogeneously regular manifold setting. So, so you want to, very important you have positive injectivity radius in the manifold. Okay. Okay, so how does one get that you don't have a plane in R3 with um, constant mean curvature, say, one? Okay. Well, if I had a plane in R3 with constant mean curvature one, then a plane is topologically, has a compact exhaustion by disks. It might not be round disks, I mean, they're, they're disks in some kind of plane, but it have an exhaustion of a plane topologically by disks. And it's complete, so therefore the radius of those disks has to go to infinity. So this is saying that's not possible. If I have a disk of constant mean curvature one embedded in R3, the radius of the disk is bounded by some universal number where radius is the distance from a point, the maximum distance from points in the disk in the interior to the boundary. Like a round disk in the plane, the, the radius is the distance from the center to the boundary. So you just generalize that. It's the maximum distance of points in the disk to the boundary of the disk. What? An intrinsic metric. And it, it's an intrinsic property, not amb ambient um, radius. Okay, so in particular, we get this corollary that we just mentioned before. You don't have planes. Okay, um, <coughs> and uh, crucial to understanding the radius estimate is actually to get a curvature estimate. So it turns out this top theorem and the bottom theorem are interrelated. For example, if I know the bottom theorem, it's easy. It's a, just a consequence of doing some just tricks. I immediately get the radius estimate. And the radius estimate is also related to this curvature estimate. So the curvature estimate is a little more subtle than it looks. Okay. So it says fix epsilon and H naught bigger than zero. All uh, right. I have a, a complete homogeneous regular manifold there. There exists a constant. Okay. Think of R, we're in R3 and um, we're looking for disks which have um, mean curvature bigger than a given constant. So we're going to lower, bound it from below. So maybe constant mean curvature disk in R3 with mean curvature bigger than one, bigger than or equal to one. So I'm going to bound it from below. Then there's this funny curvature estimate. The norm of the second fundamental well, form at any point on the disk is less than a constant. Okay? Right? In particular, that tells you the mean curvature can't be too big if you're far from the boundary, right? So this depends upon how far you're away from the boundary. Okay. So this, if you just think about it for a minute, immediate implies this. So this is sort of a subtle, subtle thing. So one property is getting curvature estimates and then getting curvature estimates that only depend on a lower bound on the mean curvature. So it's kind of a full odd kind of thing. They're kind of working together on proving this result. Okay. Um, and you can generalize this to other situations. There are curvature estimates like this one hold in locally homogeneous manifolds for disks. If you're away from the boundary by a given amount, the mean curvature is at least something, then you have to have, um, you have to have curvature estimates away from the boundary once you're a certain distance from the boundary. It doesn't depend upon the disk, okay? And uh, another place where you can do a little bit better are hyperbolic manifolds. And you, in those cases, you can prove that if the mean curvature is at least one, then you are always, uh, you're always proper. Okay? And you don't, any complete um, hyperbolic three manifold. That kind of thing is not true kind of for, if you go to R3, like think of the three torus. In a three torus, you have planes. And they're certainly not proper. 
So this, this is something, has something to do different between flat and, and uh, R3. Uh, R3 and hyperbolic space. Some, something different going on. Uh, kind of a crucial uh, property that goes into proving these results and getting sharp, sort of these sharp results that depend on intrinsic distances rather than extrinsic distances is this one-sided uh, curvature estimate. So let me just try to draw it. See that the boundary of the surface does not need to be outside of the ball. So I'm trying to do things a little more general. Underhand this picture, the disk doesn't intersect this, uh, this plane right here, inside of the ball. So I have a, have a um, right, uh, right. So I look at components here that have the property that they lie in one half of the, of the ball. So I'm ignoring this part right here. I'm ignoring that. I don't know, for example, that that is a disk. It might, it, I just know it's a subset of a disk because I don't have the convex hull property. If it was minimal, the whole, the boundary, if it was minimal, the, then that thing would be a disk. I mean, I couldn't have a part of the disk go outside of the ball. So, anyway. Anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the idea. Oh, oops. So, the, the point is, is that somehow universal estimate, so, so if you have a ball of radius R, you have a constant mean curvature disk, then the ball of radius uh, epsilon times R, I have curvature estimates. So this looks like a graph. Basically, you end up proving that that part, all the components that, that have, <laughs> all the components have the property that they, that they uh, are graphs near the origin over this disk. And graphs are stable, and stability gives you curvature estimates. Okay. And then that's, like I said, used to do a lot more things. And, but the proofs here are very strongly related to work that Colton Mikosi did previously in the minimal case. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about something called uh, the kalabi yau problem. And this is a very interesting picture, right? This is a domain in R3, and it has, has kind of a certain geometry on its boundary. It also has infinite genus, okay? So these, these kind of holes go, converge down to a point here. Uh, these, these surfaces, this is uh, probably a Mobius strip, this looks like an annulus, this looks like a disk with a handle. You can imagine connecting all these surfaces up and, and using, and they keep repeating, them, using certain ones and I can make any surface by connected sums, boundary connected sums. So I can produce stable minimal surfaces in this domain of any topology, okay? It's not, it's not a smooth domain, it's got one bad point. So imagine taking that surface and then wiggling it, wiggling it and making it uh, be embedded. Okay, so, I mean, complete, complete and embedded. So that one, you could make somehow a stable surface, but I would like to wiggle it, but when I wiggle it, it intersects itself. I try to desingularize the intersection, and if I have a lot of control, then I say I can, I can somehow fix everything. So the theorem says, the, not the theorem, the conjecture says if I have this domain, uh, then you take any complete embedded minimal, okay, okay, with an open surface with compact boundary properly minimum embeds as complete surface in this particular domain if and only if every n has infinite genus. So this might be a surface that has an inf, it may have an uncountable number of non orientable n's. Like, yeah, imagine like connecting some projected planes in some kind of really bad way. You have a very, very horrible surface, but yet it still should properly embed minimally in this domain, not in R3, but in this domain. Okay, so anyway, it's an interesting question. It's related to this Klaby Yau question. Finite topology examples or somehow bounded genus examples shouldn't have this property, but infinite, if the surface has very infinite genus, at least ge infinite genus on all its ends, then you have these kind of mappings. Okay, so there's this uh, nice conjecture uh, which tells you something about eight surfaces of finite genus and let's just for the moment assume we have no boundary at all. Uh, then there's an area estimate. So if you take a surface of finite genus uh, complete and embedded in R3 and you intersect with a big ball, you always have finite area. The surface always has finite area. In fact, not just finite area, an estimate on its area, okay? So notice we're not assuming curvature estimates, uh, we're just saying we have an area estimate, okay? 
So, what do we know about this? Uh, well, I've been work I worked on it some this summer with Giuseppe, uh, at least the H bigger than zero case. Um, but we have this sort of result. Uh, if you have the surface that's soon to be proper and it has a countable number of ends, then the conjecture is actually true. So, one can prove that the, the surface has bounded second fundamental form. Once it has bounded second fundamental form, it has a regular neighborhood. A regular neighborhood's area is the surface has approximate area up to a constant like the volume of its regular neighborhood, but the volume of the regular neighborhood can only grow cubically in R3. So that's, this would imply that result for minimal if one knew the surface was proper. Okay, we don't know, uh, we don't know, <laughs> we don't know a lot of things. Okay, anyway, it's an interesting conjecture which I think is true, I think it's true, so it's one of my favorite problems. So, in particular, we have these examples of uh, finite genus minimal surfaces. You take the catenoid, you shift the top curve, say, sideways. That gives you a one-parameter family of surfaces. And the kind of amazing property that follows from uh, sh a result of Schiffman is those surf that surface is foliated by circles in, say, horizontal planes. Okay? So, you do this, you no longer have a surface of revolution, but still the level sets are still circles. And Riemann created those examples. Oops, going the wrong way. Uh, get the point over there. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, so you go up to some level, you get a line, you can rotate around the line and continue the surface. There's a nice picture of it, and uh, and it, it turns out that one can uh, classify the moduli space of properly embedded. Uh, properly embedded, no, it's the word proper, properly embedded surfaces of genus zero. We'd like to know they're all proper, but we don't know that, so you have to assume it's proper to get this classification. Somehow we have the, cat, the Riemann examples and they connect to the helicoid and the catenoid at the extreme ends. Okay, so now we're going to go to, to another problem where we can, we kind of try, we have trouble proving that conjecture, right? But maybe we can prove the conjecture for triply periodic surfaces. So triply periodic surfaces means we somehow have surfaces in a torus. So here's an example of a minimal surface in a torus. However, it turns out if you fix the genus of a surface, you can have closed surfaces of any genus three or bigger in a three torus, a three torus and there's no bound on the area. You can have a sequence of them. Uh, for example, for genus three, you have a subsequence which have area bigger and bigger and bigger, and outside of two points, they converge to a foliation of the three torus by planes. So you can have really, really interesting things going on. Anyway, no area estimates. However, once you pick the mean curvature to be positive, the claim is you do get area estimates for closed surfaces. So if you have a closed surface, you fix the genus, you're in a fixed three torus. Then you have an estimate on the, um, on the area, and it grows somehow linearly. There's some more things you can prove for other manifolds, like hyperbolic manifolds or the three-sphere. So uh, they're similar kind of results. Okay. All right. So let me just uh, say real fast this slide. Let me see how am I doing. Oh, I'm doing pretty good on time. I mean, I could slow down a little bit. Okay. So, um, so some of this work about... Um, this is a study of the geometry of these surfaces, constant mean curvature surfaces, leads one to study more general questions. So, an old problem, I guess it was Hafliger, asked, can you foliate R3 by minimal surfaces? Right? Is that, right about that? So, Hafliger asked, can I foliate, which is not by parallel planes, can I foliate R3 by minimal surfaces and not parallel planes? The answer is no. Rick Shane, for example, Rick Shane or Sir Chapel, but they prove curvature estimates or De Carmo and Pang. They prove curvature estimates. Leaves of foliations, minimal foliations, are stable. Stable means plain. So you can't, nothing interesting with minimal. You can't foliate. But imagine by leaves of constant mean curvature, where the constant mean curvature varies from leaf to leaf. And so uh, I guess I figured out you can't do that. It was a question uh, Harold asked me. I, mean, I guess I figured that, that out for R3. So, then the question is, uh, can I foliate R3 minus a point by surfaces of constant mean curvature? Yeah, Con uh, just spheres of a radius around the origin, constant, right? 
So I can, if I allow singularities in the foliation, then I can understand that they're examples. Uh, uh, so this, th that, that sort of attitude or sort of thought leads one to try to study uh, what are called weak CMC foliations. So if you have a CMC foliation, it's always a weak CMC foliation. So, but you're, you allow certain kinds of touching, uh, anyway, it's a natural thing to look at. If you have one in a punctured ball, then it turns out you have bounded second femoral form around the puncture, and you can extend, uh, of all the leaves around the puncture, and you can extend the, uh, this weak foliate, CMC foliation across uh, the singularity. Okay, yeah, right. And it has to do with a lot of desingularization questions. In particular, you get this theorem. So if you have, say, R3 minus a finite number of points, and you foliate, foliate it by CMC surfaces outside those points, in particular, all the leaves are um, contained in spheres and planes. And you can even do weak ones. You can, you don't, you can generalize that result. So here's a picture with two singularities. Essentially, two singularities is the worst situation. You can have, you can have none, which are parallel planes. You can have one, which is like concentric spheres. You can have this, and there's more pictures you can draw. Okay. Anyway, that's what happens. But you can also, also get this in terms of rescaling. Let me just back up one slide. So notice what the condition is for extending. F extends to weak, low, weak CMC foliation if the mean curvature function is bounded. You don't need an estimate on the curvature, you just need an estimate on the mean curvature. So I should have made that a little clearer. Okay? So that's what we see in the next picture, right? The mean curvature is not bounded around the singularities. In fact, you can estimate it. It grows essentially like one over the radius. If you're in the small, if you're near an isolated singularity, the uh, second fundamental form kind of looks like one over R. Okay. So that's the kind of result. Now I'm going to go more into manifold settings. And there, it turns out most of the theorems are stated in terms of certain numbers. One's called the critical mean curvature, and the other's the, the Cheeker constant. And then the, they're related. So let me just say what this, the first one is. It kind of looks like a minimax sort of thing. It's, it's kind of weird. You take, uh, you look at all, so I'm looking at a, um, a Ramanian manifold, pro probably non-compact. I'm looking at compact subsets and I'm taking, um, I'm sorry, that's a Cheeger constant. I, I had the order different, I'm sorry. Cheeger constant, we have the, this is the standard definition for the Cheeger constant. So there's an isoparametric, so in a ratio. Area versus volume. That's the Cheeger constant. You take, take the femum over all compact sets. For example, in R3, that number is zero. Just take balls, round balls. In hyperbolic space, you can also take round balls, and you see the number is, well, that gives you at least an estimate like one. Maybe it could be different, but it's not, not hard to see that it's one for hyperbolic space. Then we have this other number that's more like a minimax sort of thing. It's in femum of the maximum of the mean curvature function. That makes sense on any surface that's closed and immersed, okay? And you take the infimum over all those numbers, okay? And that's called the critical mean curvature, okay? And the key result is, is that there's a relationship between the two, two times the mean curvature. The critical mean curvature is the Cheeker constant. So that allows us to calculate this for lots of manifolds, like hyperbolic space, the number is one for uh, critical mean curvature. Okay, how does one prove a result like this? this is, notice this is for simply connected homogeneous three manifolds. So in order to do this, you can't have to know a lot of classification of these, but anyway. Uh, so, so anyway, we have those. Basically, you have R3, you have S2 cross R, or you have a metric on the three sphere. That's, you have the three sphere with a homogeneous metric, you have S2 cross R with this product metric, a product metric, round metric, and, or you have uh, R3 topological. Okay, so how does one do that? Uh, well, the R3 topologically is complicated for one of the uh, family of metrics which come from uh, looking at it as the SL2R, special linear group, uh, you take the universal cover, that group is very interesting. That's m probably the most interesting geometry, and on it you have a three-dimensional family of metrics and some of those metrics are kind of hard to figure out that you have this equality. The other ones, it's, it, 
It's more, more, more standard, more direct. Anyway, so what goes into the proof? One looks for uh, foliations of this manifold. We talked about CMC foliations. Now I'm fixing the constant mean curvature. So the, the, the foliations which have the critical mean curvature as their cur mean curvature. And I look at, um, I look, okay, so that's, okay, so I look, use those foliations to, to show that if I have isoparametric domains in the, uh, the manifold and the volume goes to infinity, then they have some certain asymptotic properties. Uh, for example, the mean curvature, the boundary is always bigger and equal to the critical mean curvature. These surfaces have constant mean curvature. And the limit is, in fact, equal to the critical mean curvature. And another important thing in the proof here is to prove that the radius of isoparametric domains when you were in R topologically R3 setting, or actually S2 cross R also works, non-compact setting, the radius of isoparametric domains also goes to infinity. It's not, how do you do that? How, how do you know that there are always points that are inside that are far from the boundary? Anyway, that's another something that goes into the proof here. So that's, uh, that's anyway, you have this result and we're going to use it. Okay, so uh, conjecture is kind of a nice conjecture. It's the kind of problem a lot of Brazilians like to look at. Um, uh, you have a complete uh, embedded H surface of finite topology in a complete locally homogeneous three manifold X with universal cover X tilde. Okay, so you want to. <coughs> You want to prove that if H is bigger than the critical mean curvature of the universal cover, or it is the universal cover and H is bigger and equal to this number, then the surface is always properly embedded. Okay. And it's true for hyperbolic manifolds when H is bigger than equal to one. Otherwise, not true. We're going to see in a second. So, um, so for example, look at hyperbolic three space. Suppose you, remember I just said if your H was bigger than one, finite topology examples that are embedded <coughs> are always properly embedded. However, if I take any H less than one, it turns out I can put <coughs> planes in hyperbolic three space which are sort of between two catenoids, two stable catenoids, and they somehow spin into these two catenoids. I can make a foliation of a part of hyperbolic space with, with the leaves or, or, or uh, planes. Okay, so uh, we have these examples. And in H2 cross R, for any value between, between zero and one half, one half is the critical mean curvature. Again, one can construct these planes. And earlier, um, uh, these people, uh, they found minimal examples that were not proper. Complete, embedded, but not proper. So that kind of at least lets us understand some examples. We still like to know the general answer to that conjecture. Can you, it, somehow the critical mean curvature is the, is the exact right thing. Things below it, we have non-proper. Things above it, or sometimes equal to it, we're always proper. Somehow that number is very special. Okay, all right. So, um, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about some work I do with um, Alvaro uh, Ramos, and he's going to give a talk about this, some of this stuff on Thursday. Um, so the first thing is that, you, that if you take, so I'm thinking of uh, non-compact hyperbolic free manifold of finite volume. So they have these things called cusp spins, kind of torus cross a half open interval type topological ends. And uh, in, those, in those things, I'd like to say, do I have uh, complete, connected, properly embedded, non-compact eight surfaces of finite topology? And the answer is, if and only if the absolute value of this constant mean curvature is in that range. So I can't do, for example, one. If I can do any value less than one. And then this is work, on pro work in progress. Uh, we like to construct examples, okay, of every possible topology. So we, planes not possible, and annuals isn't possible, but we'd like to construct these imbe properly embedded examples uh, in general. The, I should say the examples we construct here are all totally umbilic. Okay, all right. So, and that's sort of that language then comes up here. So suppose you have uh, a complete non-compact hyperbolic free manifold, finite volume, and you look at um, 
uh, value in the mean curvature in that range, and you have a properly immersed surface, MERS, not, not embedded, surface in N of finite topology with absolute mean curvature function uh, less than that number, then you have some nice properties. You have finite total curvature, you have an estimate for the area, and it's somehow sharp. The claim is that you have examples of this type um, which are properly embedded. So this is the order of characteristic over here. So anyway, so uh, that's sort of nice. You have finite area in particular. And uh, furthermore, this is the, well, the nice thing is that the, the annular ends of the surface, finite topology means you have annular ends, then they're all asymptotic to an annulus which is totally umbilic. So totally umbilic are things that are constant distance from totally geodesic surfaces. Okay. So, all right. So this was motivated, our study here was partly motivated by a, a result for, uh, where these guys proved uh, this particular, this result for zero surfaces, minimal surfaces. So they proved this kind of, kind of very interesting, kind of surprising, and we figured out, in fact, you can, you know, jack up the result. We can prove a little bit more. Uh, I should say also we studied, we studied, this is part of a general study of, of constant, of surfaces in Hadamard manifolds. So it's, it's a more general study, but this is uh, one of the results. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to go to the last, uh, the last topic, which is, um, we actually have a reasonable amount of time, which is, uh, I'm going to go into what's called the Hopf uniqueness question. Okay, so Hoffman uniqueness question addresses classifying constant mean curvature spheres in, how uh, would you say, it? locally complete, locally homogeneous three manifolds. Since they're spheres, you might as well lift the universal cover. So you think of you're just moving the spheres around the universal cover. See, locally, you can kind of move a sphere in a quotient space as well, right? It's motion there because it's simply connected. Anyway. So I'm going to focus my attention on simply connected because that's where everything is. So for simply connected homogeneous three manifolds, we can completely understand and classify them. So, um, okay. So either you are this surface, a round sphere across R, that's certainly homogeneous and simply connected, or you're what I call a metric Lie group, and metric Lie groups means I have a Lie group, simply connected Lie group, and I have a left invariant metric. Okay? So that's nice. And it's also nice that Milner classified these. So he essentially wrote down formulas for every possible example. And basically, you're dealing with a three dimensional space here. Okay? All right. Okay. So this is a hot uniqueness problem. You have two immersed spheres in uh, such a space. Uh, does there exist an assignment who takes one to the other one? That's a sort of an aspect of this question. Also, you'd like to know when you have them. I mean, this more, you'd actually know, like to know, understand the modulus of it. But this is a sort of a sub-problem. And this, this uh, classification was carried out by uh, Abrish and Harold here. Um, and they did it in, for example, they did it more generally in, than this, but in particular, they did it for S, S2 kappa cross R. Uh, they prove all these examples are surfaces of revolution. And from that, you can see that you have, for example, this result. It's, you have to think about it a little bit. But anyway, you have a classification of these examples, and then you can see when ha we have this particular result. Okay? They did more generality, but I'm mentioning this particular result because that means to solve this problem, I only have to deal with metric Lie groups. Okay? Okay, so here's the classification for metric Lie groups. Classification of constant mean curvature spheres, immersed, right? So, X is simply connected, three-dimensional metric Lie group. So now we're not saying homogeneous, we're saying metric Lie group. S2 cross R, the other situation, okay? So, or, and of course S3, but I'm focusing now, uh, yeah, S3 or top, topologic S3 or topologic R3. So if it's diffeomorphic to R3, then you have a nice characterization of the spheres. The moduli space of up to congruence of the spheres is an interval. So for each value of the mean curvature in this interval, I have a unique example. And somehow it's an analytic space. I mean, that example 
is somehow an analytic parameter of examples. So it's uh, really an integral in a natural sense. Um, uh, if you're diffeomorphic to S3, that's our other possibility for metrically group. Then it, the answer is much more rigid. Um, it turns out that uh, you get all possible mean curvatures. So there's one sphere for every constant mean curvature. Furthermore, if you're in the three sphere, if it's topologically the three sphere, you have a universal estimate on the area. So you start with these uh, very small rounds, almost round spheres, very small, think of solving isoparametric problems very small volume, you get these very small little almost round spheres. So the volume certainly goes down into zero, and then it goes up to some biggest number. And it might not be at the minimal surface. It might not be at the minimal sphere. So you can go up to the minimal sphere and still increase the area some, but you're bounded. You're in, you have an interval. And there's some example that achieves that biggest area. Okay. And the other nice property of this, uh, the way the proof works is that you see that all of the spheres that you get in a metrically grouped setting, uh, all bound balls, immersed balls, and uh, these, the, okay, they're, so they're Alexander embedded and bounding an immersed ball, and the index of the surfaces is one and the null of these three. So again, this kind of thing is not true in S2 cross R. So you just, just got to keep in mind. We're, we're doing not the S2 cross R case where we understand the classification. Okay. So we're going to try to see how do you prove this. So the, the proof is really uh, trying to analyze pr the examples which you think you have. Somehow these minimax examples of some sort. Index one examples. Okay? So, well, they're not, they're not really minimax. They're, anyway. Uh, so. I'm restricting to this case. So suppose I have an H naught sphere in the space and it has index one. Okay. Then step one is to see that it has a particular nullity. And this is uh, this is a, just a generalization of Chang's theorem for uh, anyway, it works for Schrodinger operators on a two sphere. Okay. So Chang's theorem says the nullity is at most three using the Jacobi operator as your Schrodinger operator. Okay, step, okay, so we have a nullity three. So that's part of the theorem, but we have to know that everything has index one to know we have nullity three. So right now we, we're just assuming we have this index one. If you have index one and nullity three, then you can apply the implicit function theorem and see there's a curve of examples. Whenever I have an example, there's an analytic deformation. It's nearby, this is one, this analytic family of uh, spheres that deforms, okay? So that, that means the, and I, from, I want you to remember this notation. This is the moduli space of non-congruent index one examples, okay? And it's somehow, once you fix an example at a place, then you have a curve of examples coming out of it. So we see this one manifold uh, picture. It doesn't mean it's connected one manifold, it's just a one manifold picture. Okay, then we have this, this uh, result which is still to me surprisingly difficult to prove. It's, uh, it's not like super hard to prove, but it's hard. I, I can never remember the proof. I kind of, I actually we kind of came up with this proof when we were at Bruzio's. So, so I kind of came up with the proof, doesn't mean it's easy to remember or easy to do. But anyway, it's true. So if you have an index one sphere, then it has a real nice property with its left invariant Gauss map. So we take the sphere, I think of it as being oriented, I take its unit normal, I left translate it to the tangent space at the identity. So that's a map from the surface to the unit sphere at the identity element in the tangent, tangent space of the, uh, at, the, at the identity element. It's called the left invariant Gauss map. Just like the usual Gauss map in R3, R3 is a leak group. It's the same thing, it's the same, same mapping. Okay, then, it, then, it, then what happens if it has index one, it's always a degree one diffeomorphism, okay? And uh, for people who are familiar with minimal surfaces and rescaling arguments, minimal surfaces in R3 have what property? They have minus one. Their degree of their Gauss map is minus, kind of, kind of like negative, I mean, okay? That's a, so, so by rescaling, you can see immediately that once you know this, you have curvature estimates. Once the mean curvature is bounded 
you have an upper bound for H naught. So we have curvature estimates. We have these one manifolds. Maybe we can analyze things. The next thing we need is area estimates, right? If you have curvature estimates, area estimates, we can analyze things better. So that's the hardest part of this whole story. Okay. In the case of SU2, that's the three sphere topologically. In that case, uh, one can prove you have uniform estimates on the area. And then you can imagine the proof is much easier for everything. The hard case is when you don't have area estimates. And yet I said area estimates. So I got to be careful in what I mean. What do we mean by area estimates? So when you're not this, that means you're topologically R3. Uh, you have this, pick any positive number at all and look at the range of examples in this range. So away from the critical mean curvature, okay, by some positive amount. Then I do get area estimates. So once, as I get close to the critical mean curvature, area might not be bounded. with. Once I say I'm away from the critical mean curvature, I get uniform estimate on the area. Okay, so that's the hard part, and it's quite long, long and hard. Okay, so um, let me shoot the point over here. On this. Okay, so yep. okay, so <coughs> once you get area estimates, then you can understand what happens in these examples. The the, the spheres can keep going until they stop having finite area. But that can only happen when they go to certain values. And they can always go kind of smaller, right? They can always, mean curvature can always increase. Uh, so anyway, we kind of understand the, the components of this space. They, they go, they start at, uh, okay, in this case, they're, they're uh, anyway, we can understand the components of the space, the, how they're parameterized. So in particular, we get all possible, but if you remember the definition of the critical mean curvature, Every constant mean curvature sphere has mean curvature bigger than or equal to this number. Let me go back one slide I forgot to mention. It follows from this that, that there, no, there are no h of x spheres in, in x. That, that's something you have to calculate. Okay? So you have to, for example, know stuff about the Cheeger constant. You can see that there are no h of x spheres. Okay? So uh, that means we're always in the mean curvature, say, when we're R3 in this range. Okay? And so I'm going to go continue. In particular, if I have any, any other H of naught sphere, then I have sigma, right? Because sigma is one of these components of index, of, uh, sorry, of index 1. And then I can kind of compare this, the two second fundamental forms. I can kind of, but via the Gauss map, I can track their second fundamental forms. I can create a uh, complex value quadratic differential with isolated negative indices. That's assuming it's not a left translation. Remember, we're trying to think, uh, what, is, what is my uniqueness? Up to isometry, but actually this is a little strong. It's actually up to left translation. That's one way to get isometries. So it's a stronger classification. So it's actually the isometry is by left translation. Okay, so anyway, if you have such a form on a sphere, that can't, you can't have an, happen unless all the, all these index, you don't, you don't, you can't have, it can't, it has to be identically zero. And if it's identically zero, then you see that uh, by this result, anyway, you can't, anyway, that, that, that tells you that, that any other example is a left translation. Otherwise, it creates this two form on it, which can't exist. So it must have been a left translation. Okay, so conclusions from those uh, properties. Step, the seven steps, which uh, like I said, number four is very quite difficult, is um, you can understand the uh, space of the spheres is equal to this entire space. That's what this last step did, right? Okay? And, uh, right, and, right, and it's an interval, right? I can't have two index ones with the same thing. There's only one component in this space, right? That's what this, these two steps together saying there's one component, and we know how it parameterizes things, okay? And uh, so that gives us a part of the theorem. Oh, okay, do it over here. Um, okay, so uh, also we get index one and nullity three. That was step two, I think, right? If you're index one, we know we're index one, so we must also be nullity three. And we also know when the mean coverage is really big, it's a the surface is almost a little round sphere around a little ball, so it's embedded. It bounds a ball. 
Then as the mean curve, as it moves to this family, that ball continues to move. Maybe it goes through itself, but uh, you get an immersed ball. So you just kind of follow that ball. As the surface moves a little bit, you just kind of move with it. You can't kind of touch inside by the maximum principle. So, so that gives you that. And um, right, and then, like I said, we had area estimates for spheres. That was step four. So if you're S, SU3, if your top logic is the sphere, then you have area estimates. So it's a kind of a very nice story. That the proof is kind of kind of cool and, and neat. I, anyway, but we're still working on writing it all up. Okay, and here's uh, something to food for thought. Probably a lot of people have wondered about this. You have R3 with a homogeneous metric. Then you'd like to say when you solve an isoparametric problem for a given volume, there's a unique solution, and it. Uh, well, actually, maybe that's the, third, the second one. Uh, so you you solve plot, you solve an isoparametric problem for a fixed volume, which you could do. Then what you get is a ball that's embedded, and its boundary is the boundary sphere is this as a particular one of these spheres in this family, and they're all different. They're somehow you can't have two balls with the same volume. So if you want to look at that, if you take, for example, think of this as a Lie group, pick the identity element, okay? And the claim is you can foliate the complement of the identity element by your spheres. Just like you do in R3, spheres of a given radius center at the origin. Is a natural way of, uh, once you fix a point in the space, all these spheres have something called a center of uh, symmetry. Uh, there's another, even though they might not be embedded, there's a notion of a center of symmetry. You put them in the symmetri symmetry, you get an analytic family of spheres, and presumably it foliates the space. And you can prove that in certain spaces, like H2 cross R. Um, and we can prove in, a, in some, a number of spaces you can prove this sort of like uh, nil Heisenberg space. You can prove you have this foliation, but we don't know it in general. Okay, all right, that's probably it.